Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tony Crutchfield, your moderator for today's panel. Thank you for joining us. The rapid growth in China and Russia's anti-access, aerial denial, and other capabilities are undermining U.S. deterrence and increasing the risk of miscalculation and potential conflict. To combat our adversaries' increasing capabilities, U.S. joint force and combined forces can strengthen deterrence by creating multiple dilemmas, multiple domains, with multiple partners to decisively complicate war plans of potential adversaries. To succeed against the advanced threat, Army forces must be capable of fully integrating with other services and allied capabilities to fight and win. The Army plays a crucial role, must be trained, postured, and ready to respond. Our forum titled Preparing the Force for MTO, the Regionally Aligned Readiness and Modernization Model, or REARM, is one of eight of uh, eight US, AUSA's contemporary military forums conducted over the last three days. AUSA continues to amplify the US Army and helps to further the association's mission to be the voice of the Army and support for the soldier. We'll kick off the forum with Lieutenant General Charlie Flynn, the US Army's G357. And then we'll move to the panel discussion followed by a Q&A session. General Flynn. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks to the rest of our uh, great panel today. And uh, let me thank the uh, entire audience in AUSA and you for our Army and uh, for our soldiers. I'm, uh, I'm honored today to be in great company with some, uh, some great comrades. Um, and I, I just want to express but thanks for uh, for attending today's. Uh, so we're uh, the last two plus years we've been on a journey to our today. Uh, with the national defense strategy back in 2018, Air Force employment, strategic competition, recognition need of a new model, 18 and 19, and then go on step development of this. Uh, in 19, and then uh, where we are today in 20, get this to become a reality. So we're working on five key points today. Why me adopting uh, this new federal, which uh, my hope is that Dr. Cramer War College will provide some context in, uh, in a historical perspective that the Army's been here before. I'll then go into uh, myself and describe some of the key components. Uh, my, my battle buddies, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Lee Quintus, will then uh, talk about its formations, training, uh, uh, soldiers, and readiness from his perspective as the deputy commanding for and, and then, of course, uh, Lieutenant General Donnie Walker, my battle buddy at Army Material Command, he'll discuss the aspects of this in terms of building new equipment, uh, divestiture. The uh, material and equipment support that's going to be required to reinforce the Army Force Generation model. And then after that, I'll hit some key milestones and then we'll uh, go over in the, uh, a discussion uh, on your questions and answers. So let me just uh, jump from it's already up there right now. It's got this uh, total activity framework we refer to as overseas. Often I get questions on. Uh, what is the re army ready for and, uh, and ready for what? What kind of mission? So what we have outlined here is the four C's, conditions, conflict, and change. Competition really talked about, the thing Crutchfield talked up front, about the strategic long-term competition uh, with Russia, China, but then there's also other Spoilers out there, other competitors like North Korea, like, Iran, like extremism. Those activities that the military and your army is involved in every day, we are out there in domain creating access by our presence and our influence across the globe. And the army is always in motion, and we're competing as a team. And we're trying to be strategically predictable to, lot, to our allies and partners, while at the same time being operationally unpredictable to our adversaries and foes or those that might do us harm. And trying to achieve this by without fun. But in fact, 
we also have to go through a transition or the vulnerability of transition between competition and crisis. Crisis is this of dynamic employment out of the national defense strategy for planned and unplanned events. It's in time, place, worldwide, whether it's a hurricane barreling down on us in the Gulf of Mexico on the East Coast, fighting wildfires to pandemics. And let me just paint a picture for crisis in 2020. So everything from the operations leading up to the Soleimani strike in the Middle East to a global pandemic to the range of missions uh, where the National Guard, the Reserve, and the active component is in a range of crisis across the globe. This is something that we have to prepare for, we have to plan for, and then we have to actually deploy forces and then recover from those uh, crises, some of those that I just mapped out. And then, again, this is the Army mission. We have to fight and win, particularly in large-scale combat operations, painting land power. We have to have a response from the tactical to the operational to the strategic. The operation includes things like combat training centers, the new corps in the head corps in the, uh, in the Army with 5th Corps. But strategic readiness also requires platforms, army pre and large exercises like we executed here and out in the Indo-Pacific. Planning is really important in the part. We have to do that planning because it requires us to do the 4D mission of that box, um, and that is required of your army in the event of a breakout. And then the last box at the bottom change, and you can see from the slide that much is the elements of competition, crisis, and conflict. The Army uh, is required to conduct financial change, as our Chief and Secretary talk about. We must be able to adapt and innovate. You can see on the slide the three tenets of our future operating separated force posture, multi domain formations, and convergence. Of the activities are going on day to day. The Army is going through its changes. We are modernizing for new systems. We are integrating through a, uh, a project uh, experimentation path that we have underway for the next couple of years. And then, of course, rearm. What we're talking about today is the force generation model that we intend to use to balance readiness and modernization while also allowing its inside a cycle system that generates forces for the joint force uh, The last uh, comment I'd make is uh, in uh, just yesterday uh, I published an article on the four C's and with that I'll pause and hand it over to Con Crane who will go over some historical context of change that's happened in the Army before. Con, over to you. Okay, can I, am, I, am I coming through? Uh, I have uh, just provided uh, uh, General Flynn with a detailed study on what I'm gonna go over right now. So that should be available uh, uh, somewhere in a posting for AOSA or else people can contact me at conrad.c.crane.civ and mail.mil to get it. Uh, bottom line is during the last century, uh, the Army has experienced magnified transformational bursts of modernization about every 40 years. Uh, the first was during the mobilization for World War II in the 1940s. The second involved the fielding of the Big Five and associated systems in the 1980s. Both were enabled by a significant amount of innovative thinking in times of tight budgets that could be funded by a later influx of money. Uh, these opportunities for mass modernization always put considerable strain on the development of corresponding training, doctrine, and organizations. Uh, and also a challenge in maintaining contemporary combat capability. Uh, first slide, please. Okay, the, the bottom, the main point of this particular slide is this, just that it's a dangerous time in the 1980s as well. Uh, 
China is not the, as big a threat, but the Soviet Union is a much bigger threat at the height of the Cold War. They're in Afghanistan and Angola. North Korea, we basically in the 60s and 70s have a low intensity shooting war there. Uh, Kim Il sung goes to China and asked to reinvade South Korea in the mid 1970s. So that's a very, still a very dangerous theater. Obviously, the Middle East is in its usual turmoil. The Iran Iraq war is going on, the tanker war as well uh, in the Persian Gulf. And then there's other problems as well. You've got Lebanon uh, in our incursion there. You've got the problems with Gaddafi in Libya. You've got the things going on in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and worldwide terrorism. So it's a dangerous time in the 1980s as well. Next slide. Uh, the key thing on this slide is that at the bottom, it says the Army developed and incorporated the Big Five into the force intermittently and iteratively. Agile assessment, adaptation, and innovation integrated the Big Five into Army formations. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's done a piece at a time. It's done a unit at a time. It's different in CONUS than it is in Europe. Uh, some general observations on the process of filling the Big Five. Uh, Divisions and installations required a robust force modernization staff to coordinate the process. Uh, units transitioned to new organizations before they began their new equipment training. Uh, uh, you had to redistribute equipment. Uh, vehicles had to be turned in at 1020 standards, which was quite a burden on support units and expensive. Units often rolled down equipment. The, as one unit got their M1s, they might roll their M60A3s down a unit and had M60A1s. Uh, uh, and there were problems with Pomkus. You had to re actually you know, fix up and uh, uh, modernize the Pomkus stocks as well. Uh, for re you know, the, for re-equipping, uh, it was more than just the big five. It's more than 50 systems. I'll talk about that in a minute as well, which included things like add new ranges, new test equipment, new PLLs for all this. I mean, it, it's more than just putting a, a piece of equipment in the field. Then there's, they have to do a lot of retraining as well. The, uh, the, we got new doctrine as well as new equipment. Uh, the, the development of the big five systems happened before the development of airland battle doctrine, but they really enabled it when it was fully developed. Uh, and, but units had to be prepared to fight a mix of old and new systems as, as again, as this iterative modernization went on. Uh, you had to, uh, uh, they had a problem stabilizing units during transitions as they were doing the modernization. I know that's something the Army is very hard to fix this time around. Uh, and uh, new MOSs were required for some of the equipment as well. And the last thing is they actually had to develop a whole new readiness reporting system to deal with the increase in capability that was in the field with new equipment, but at the same time, because of a bunch of other factors, a lot of the old readiness standards that no longer apply. So they took some innovation in that respect as well. Next slide. This is just to show that there, it's a lot more than just the big five in systems. Uh, there's, like I said, there's more than 50. You're talking about everything from Stinger missiles, um, Hemets and, and Humvees, uh, new kind, new missiles, uh, new ammunition supply vehicles, mine clearing. I mean, it, it's a total transformational modernization of the Army that really develops a whole a completely different force. And, and really, from the larger study we did, we came up with 10 uh, primary findings. And I'll just go them real quickly here. Uh, these are kind of insights, both looking at both World War II and the 80s. First one is that modernization cannot truly begin to any great degree without congressional funding, but it can continue even when budgets decline. A lot of times, they ended up with upgrades of existing systems, but the whole process of modernization continues. It, as I mentioned, it requires investment at headquarters and installation infrastructure. Uh, things like training ranges. When, when the M1s came in, they, they, their capabilities exceeded the, the, the capability of the, 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 the training ranges that were available to check them out. Modernization includes significant support requirements for all the major systems. And among these key support requirements are multiple disciplinary, multidisciplinary new equipment training teams that need to involve agencies like the Army Material Command, TRADOC, and other people to build these systems correctly. Modernization inevitably causes personnel friction as units are reorganized, and I know the Army is really looking hard at that right now. Training, doctrine, and modernization usually develop at the same time and thus inform one another. Big one, there is never enough modernization to go around. You always end up with a mix of old and new systems, and you've got to be able to work them 
and systems are always being upgraded and changing. These big bursts of modernization occur about every 40 years or so, result in more than just a better force, they completely transform it. And modernization never really ends. It's a continuing process we exist with all the time. Last one is reports on the status of modernization must be able to distinguish between readiness and capability. So that'll be a challenge as you do modernization to make sure that we don't get tangled up in bureaucratic readiness uh, goals and really understand how capability of units is increasing with the new equipment. So that's basically my piece. And again, hopefully the study will get posted so people can see the, the more extensive work we did and I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Okay. Uh, thanks. On this, uh, just really just a little bit of a setup before going to the next slide. So, uh, rearm is uh, evolutionary, not revolutionary. We have made changes before in the past. In fact, that rearm uh, has looked at the past models and it's basically taken the best practices from everything from our end to sustainable readiness to some other uh, efforts that have been under the last couple of it also allows us to adapt to the national and the defense planning guidance. And then the last thing, as in, uh, just before I get into the next, uh, we're really trying to create a flexible, predictable model that allows us to modernize, train, and to meet both the Army and joint demands of what we currently have to execute by way of measure. And what we will likely be uh, in the future. So, rearm gives us a tool to address those requirements. If you can go slide. Okay, so largely the Army has been operating under a demand. We get a demand and we feel that we are going to move to a model that is supply based. We have a certain supply of studies that we can provide. And those will have to use tailor and to address the requirements uh, that are levied on the army. The, uh, the slide is a build slide from left to right. It talks about the modernization cycle, and then it goes into the training cycle and then the mission cycle. So modernization cycle, we're trying to enable that transitional change across .pf. It's the material modernization, it's the unit shifts that have to happen in order to get to the multi-domain force of the future. Again, we want flexibility. We need a cyclic uh, type of framework that allows what we call landing spots for advanced capabilities to go to certain units. Same time landing spots for upgrades in legacy equipment that we are going to not and then we're going to continue to have it for us. It anticipates some mixed uh, modernization levels. There's going to have to be adjustments for level modernization across the Army based on missions. Combo 2 and 3 uh, are going to have some of the most modern capabilities in it. We're working through the details of that now. But we're going to do this in order to build that multi-domain of the future, much like Khan just outlined in a course where we've had that challenge before. In the training uh, cycle, we want to get anticipated missions. We want to tailor those uh, requirements so we know is it ready for, Central Command you're getting ready for, the Indo Pacific get, get ready for, something in the homeland. It we need to tailor that training inside that training window so that we have to get it ready for the right, the right forces get it ready for the right mission at the right time. And that soldiers will know where they're likely going to be operating in. And this also builds units with deep wells of some mission knowledge in each one of the, uh, of the fears that they may be operating in because they then know the environment conditions, the allies, the partners, uh, and just the general state of uh, the region in those various regions. And then across over in the mine, this is where we'll have units ready for uh, We'll provide a certain amount of units within that, uh, within that window. It'll be predictable. We'll fill if map requirements. We'll conduct dynamic force employment. 
some organizations, and they will enhance our competitive stance, as I talked about in the four C's, because we are looking for ways to create uh, trends, reduce our vulnerabilities between competitiveness and conflict. And we see being able to do that with this cyclic system of modernizing and mission forces to have build those habitual relations with allies and partners and with the fears that we most operate in. So Army, uh, what Rearm is gonna do for the Army is gonna enable transformation change. It's aligned forces regionally to focus on that competition and conflict uh, aspect of the four C's and it's gonna allow us to uh, sense the total Army for modernization. Uh, let me let me pause there and uh, hand over to my Lee Quintus at Forces Command. Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Lieutenant General Lee Quintus, I'm the Deputy Commander at U.S. Army Forces Command. And my thesis that I propose to you today is that rearm will present opportunities to achieve a new level of predictability in our formations. Let's talk about today. Today. Force comm units operate in an environment of unpredictability and arguably even instability. Units are placed on rotational missions based on their availability. And these, these missions vary in location, length, manning, readiness requirements, and equipment, just to name a few. And modernization today occurs when we can find a window to fit it in or simultaneous with other activities. Every week, month, and year, is filled with not only constant change, but also high tempo. Now our soldiers and families can deal with a lot of tempo, but tempo with unpredictability results in an incredible amount of stress on the force. Why is this important? Our Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army, even this week, have placed people first. And the Chief of Staff of the Army describes three critical areas where we, the Army, have an unbreakable commitment with the American people and that's in the areas of suicide, sexual harassment, sexual assault, and extremism and racism, and driving those incidents to zero. I submit that our ability to address these issues directly relates to providing predictability to our formations. So how are we arm enable predictability? I see it in four major areas. First, we establish rotational alignment. Soldiers and leaders will have known and habitual missions to execute. From organizational to individual levels, we gain familiarity, we build processes and habits, we build relationships with allies and partners, we optimize our skills and equipment to win in this particular environment. Second, we drive to division alignment. Imagine that divisions at our camps, posts, and stations are aligned to a specific rotation. Division leaderships align priorities and resources to accomplish the specified mission under rearm. We achieve unity of command. Third, we bake in modernization. Under rearm, we build in time to divest the old, field the new. This is focused, dedicated time to achieve modernization within the assigned modernization level. And then fourth, we build component alignment. We have the opportunity to habitually align component missions for the Army National Guard and the U.S. Army Reserve. And I would argue predictability is especially important to the reserve component. Now, it's not all rainbows and unicorns under rearm. And I see three key areas where we have challenges. First, in manning. How do we implement a manning strategy to support rearm that provides stability for modernization and maximizes the knowledge, skills, and attributes of our soldiers? Second, requirements. Regional alignment and divisional alignment necessitate change to how we support combatant commanders. We have to achieve a supply-based approach in order to provide predictability, especially to high demand forces like our aviation brigades and our air and missile defense units. And then third, rearm is a competition-based model. So how do we transition from competition for the Army to crisis and then conflict? So in summary, I believe that rearm portends significant positive change for our units, soldiers, and families, particularly in the area of predictability. And I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you.
Okay. Hey, thanks, Lee. Uh, I think I'm up next. Uh, General Donnie Walker, I'm the uh, Deputy Commanding General of AMC. Good afternoon to everyone up on the net today. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in our discussion on rearm. Uh, just as our Secretary of the Army stated yesterday in his opening remarks, the time is now, and it truly is now, to embrace rearm, as it will enable Army transformational change to a multi-domain capable force, bringing with it what the Secretary phrased as order and predictability to the process, and Lee kind of talked about that as well. This afternoon, I want to provide some insight into how AMC and the Sustainment Enterprise are going to support this model to ensure a predictable and ready force pool uh, for our Army. As Charlie Flynn alluded to uh, earlier in his remarks, during this era of great power competition, I think it's the rearm process that will definitely build that modernized force capable of delivering uh, decisive victory with new equipment fielding and, and the importance of divestiture of legacy equipment through predictable windows of execution. Uh, in order to meet the Army needs and those needs of the combatant commanders, AMC, in conjunction with Forces Command, have created uh, what we call the Modernization Displacement and Repair Site Initiative, uh, better known as MDRS. We believe MDRS will improve efficiencies, it's going to speed up divestiture operations, and it's going to allow an increase in new equipment fielding velocity across our Army. I don't have to tell the, everyone on the net that our adversaries in both the European and Asian regions continue to modernize their equipment uh, across all domains in competition with the U.S. This is primarily the reason that we have to focus on the successful execution of rearm and, and have the rearm model uh, and its essential task. I'm talking about develop, implement, and adjust in stride to codify our desired effects. In past modernization efforts, I would add that unit equipping and divestiture windows exceeded 12 months and in some cases, 18 months to complete. Uh, Dr. Crane alluded to that in his pitch. Uh, the rearm model objective is going to be to reduce that window to six months, and we already have ASALT and the Army G8 continuing their analysis to determine the feasibility and supportability of hitting a reduced timeline of that nature. I think we can do it. So what's the bottom line for, uh, for my piece today? Well, it's simply this. Our Army needs a sustainment community to find innovative solutions that create pre predictability for our soldiers generate fielding velocity, speed divestiture of old equipment, and unencumber units undergoing the process. Uh, the MDR concept, or MDRS concept shown here on my slide uh, that you see in front of you describes such a framework, its objectives, and timeline. In close partnership with FORCECOM, our Army Sustainment Command it's conducting a proof of concept with 2-1 CAV ABCT at Fort Hood, Texas, to see just how rapidly we can unburden our tactical formations of excess equipment. Our plan is to have that site IOC by the end of this month and achieve full operational capability by 1 December of 20. Conceptually, under the framework, units are going to realize a few things. Faster and more efficient divestiture processes for their legacy equipment. The MDRS will accept turn-ins in an as-is condition, thus relieving the, those units of accountability and unburdening their sustainment elements to focus on receiving new equipment. That's the name of the game for us. In the end, we believe this proof of concept is going to allow us to learn and iterate as we prepare to replicate and deploy MDRS to the whole force by FY22. In order to stay on our time hack, I look forward to your questions today. Really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to speak to you all today, and I'm going to send it back to Charlie. Over to you, Charlie. Hey, uh, very quickly, because I know this question will come up, so I, I might as well make a comment right now. So how are we implementing this? Um, so as I mentioned, we did this for the better part of two years. We're mid making iterations, or we're iterating our way through. Some of it's just at the end of this month, 
fact, next week we're going to do a rock drill down at uh, Lee Quintus's headquarters uh, at Forces Command. We've got another conference at uh, uh, Donnie Walker's uh, uh, headquarters at AMC next month. So, adjustments and the planning, coordination, and synchronization will be going in one. And we intend to have the Army LD, the, the first generation model rearm in FY22. So it'll be just about a year from now. Uh, the fitness challenges, just like uh, in the 80s, uh, as Dr. Crane laid out. Uh, but the fact is, we have a tool to manage this change. And uh, from the adjustments in the strategic environment that we do, to the changes that are happening within our own force, you see a model that enables us to build the future for our, uh, our nation needs. So with that, Tony, I'll pause I go to you, and for the next 15 minutes or so, we'll uh, answer any questions that the audience may have. Tony, over to you. Thank you, General Glenn. Uh, the questions are now coming in, so uh, let me start, uh, first of all, uh, with uh, a question, uh, as General Quintus, you mentioned in your comments about uh, people first. And the question is, um, the Secretary mentioned that, as you said, in his uh, Army New Priorities with people uh, as the first priority. How does REARM support people first? General Quintus. Hey, sir, thank you for that. Um, I talked about predictability, which I think will carry us a long way. Uh, people want to know what they're what they're going to do for the next day, week, month, and year. Um, so, so that will help us. But um, I, I think we also would would agree that uh, making people first is also setting themselves setting them up for success. Everybody wants to be successful at their mission. And as you heard General Walker talk about, part of what we've got to do is we got to apply the appropriate level of resources and prioritization against particular missions. And so, in the divestiture. Uh, mission, that's an area where we think the enterprise uh, can really help us and help uh, those individuals who have been charged with divesting of old equipment. Um, we often think about that supply sergeant as a, sort of the center of gravity for how do we how do we move and divest equipment. So it's really about how do we help that individual and help that company commander um, at that at that decisive point. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You know, uh, Dr. Crane pointed out that, um, number one, modernization doesn't happen all at once. And in fact, there is a trickle down, especially when it comes to turn of equipment. And Dr. Crane mentioned also about 1020 standards and, and the extra burden that will place on units. General Walker, uh, how do units turn in their equipment if they aren't to 1020 standards? And what will AMC do with that equipment to redistribute, rebuild, or dispose of? Yeah, hey, thanks for that. And um, to, the short answer is uh, they, they will turn it in if it requires to be at 1020. Uh, when they bring all of it to the MDRS, uh, the site that I discussed, a quick joint TI will be done with, uh, with the team that we're going to put in place there uh, with the supported unit, and then we'll take it. Um, we'll take it, whether it uh, needs to get turn, uh, brought to 1020, or in most cases, and we believe about 75% of the equipment will either go to DLA DS, uh, Disposition Services, for uh, disposal, or it'll go back to our depots uh, to be refurbished, reset, and brought back to 1020 there. Uh, but if it, but it, if, it, if it is a, a bigger Army requirement and needs to be brought to 1020, uh, we'll still take it at the MDRS site. Um, and uh, the supported unit will provide us uh, cost or funding for uh, labor and parts, and we'll we'll take it off their hands. As Lee as Lee alluded to, that's uh, that's the big thing we want to do: take immediate accountability so the unit can focus on new equipment fielding. Thank you, sir. Uh, this uh, uh, next question is uh, for General Flynn. Sir, what, will rearm replace or support sustainable readiness? Yes, actually, it will. And, uh, you know, I 
we'll come back to uh, a couple of comments I made my, in my uh, We've been looking at this for a couple of years. Can we and Donnie and the staff of both AMC, uh, force con ACs, um, there are some elements, some business rules inside of sustainable transfer. Uh, so again, we don't want to uh, throw all the goodness that we've learned over the past uh, few years. So those business rules are going to apply, uh, Tony, in this model, but not the transfer. Uh, because as Donnie and Lee have outlined, it's different. And I also would bring uh, in the fact uh, that uh, just the historical context that that Khan brought up. So the, in the uh, in the study that we completed, right, there's a uh, host I set up to come out of training, doctrine, modernization, and they're going to inform other things that we're doing inside of this model. And so we'll have to make the updates we go along. So we're trying to create this model again that has everything, all of the goodness that we learned from sustainable readiness, all of the things that Lee and Donnie outlined here. Uh, but it's going to have to be flexible and adaptable and uh, to be able to create uh, opportunities when those opportunities arrive. Because sometimes we're uh, create those for ourselves. Uh, so those will transfer, and we are basically in the throes of uh, updating the business rules right now. We'll do these rock drills and rehearsals that we've been performing. So we uh, come out with the best product at the end of 21 before the end of this in 22. Thanks, Tony. Uh, General Flynn, uh, I'm going to stay with you because this is a very interesting question, one uh, that you and I wrestled with uh, when you were the commander of 25th Division and I was the decon of PACOM. Uh, and, and the question is, sir, there was always a tension with Pacific Pathways versus sustain sustainable readiness, uh, readiness consumption versus production. How does REARM manage this tension? So, uh, uh, great question. So, uh, again, back to uh, my answer really is contained in the course of work. Um, we have the training, uh, and as you noted, uh, and as I outlined, we have a training site uh, for our tactical units to continue to execute their combat training centers at the, at the CTCs that the Army has. Uh, but that is one level readiness at the tactical echelon. There is operational and strategic readiness. And many times, the only time they exercise that kind of readiness is when you deploy outside of the confines of the continent. And so using pathways as an example, you just can't replicate the readiness gains. And I'll, I'll use a, a, a nation force example since you're an aviator. By the first country that that force moves into and into the training area, if it takes them years to aggregate their forces, build the tower, and then get out to the tactical assembly area, by the country that they've done that in, if you're out operating, uh, what I found through ways is our soldiers learned, and they learned very quickly. When they can get that buildup of combat power down to hours as to days, it's a degree of strategic readiness that we only have by going into the regions, operating with allies and partners, environment that we're likely to be going to be in if a foe or adversary wanted to depart from to test us in crisis or pursue a path to conflict. I think it's a great example of the difference between what we get from tactical readiness at trainers or even war fighters and the readiness that we gain by operating at sea and with our allies and partners. Great question, Tony. Thanks. Thank you, General Flynn. This next question is for General Quintus. Sir, how do you uh, how do reserve and national guard units 
fit into this model? Hey, hey sir, thank you. Um, first, I, I think we, we have already started moving towards some level of alignment of mission sets uh, for the Guard and, and for the Reserve based on what the rotational requirements are today. So I think there's, there's a baseline from which we can, we can leverage um, and, and really putting that and formalizing that as we go forward. So that's the first part. And the second is um, I, I do believe that the, the Guard and Reserve will have different approaches to this based on the types of formations that they provide. Uh, and I think we're going to see that here in the next week as we go to our, our rearm rock drill. So I don't want to uh, uh, preclude a, any of their decision space, but I, I do see opportunity for us to uh, more directly move the Guard and the Reserve into a, a, a rearm model. Cool. Thanks, sir. This uh, next question really is uh, would uh, go out to all of you as we begin to wrap things up. Uh, I'd like to get a comment from uh, General Flynn, General Quintus, uh, General Walker, and then Dr. Creighton in that order, if you would. Um, just your thoughts on, uh, do you see changes in priorities within the Joint Staff impacting the ability for HQDA to fully execute rearm? So just a couple of thoughts from each of you as we wrap up, please. Yeah, hey, Tony, great question. Yes, we're going to have to work with them and the uh, Global Combatant Command makes sense to, uh, to deployments. Uh, I think dynamic force employment model within the global operating model in support of uh, new globally integrated base plans, the path that we intend to pursue. Uh, and we are uh, done multiple dynamic force employments. Uh, under that model and support of the Joint Staff and the GCC, we can do continue on that path in support of that uh, global integration. And uh, I think that the Army is in a good position to do exercise everything uh, from tactical readiness to readiness and everything in between for our units uh, in, in, uh, as they are at their length depending on what cycle they're in inside a rearm. So thanks for that question. John Quintus. Hey, sir, thanks. Um, I, I think there are, there are key elements here that make a rearm uh, possible. First is uh, the, the current uh, priority of the national defense strategy. If that remains consistent, then I, I see us uh, moving forward with rearm. Also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is a competition-based model, and so our commitment to compete uh, across our various combatant commands is is a is a priority uh, under under rearm. And then uh, there are some there are some pending decisions we think on posture in various uh, uh, in various areas, and that will influence uh, our, our stance for rearm. And then, as uh, as Charlie Flynn has mentioned, uh, this is a we, we currently, frankly, are operating under a demand-based uh, system. We've got to move to supply. Uh, as as uh, Dr. Crane indicated, uh, under modernization, we are going to have to take units offline. And so uh, our ability to support uh, current demand levels will change as we, as we do some wholesale change to formations to get us set for the future. Thank you. Thanks. And with about a minute left, could I get comments first from General Walker, then Dr. Crane? Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Tony. So um, I think the uh, each of the combatant commands, uh, as we develop rearm, uh, will embrace it for a lot of the reasons that uh, General Flynn laid out uh, in the opening, um, because they'll, you know, we'll have uh, units uh, build reps in particular regions. I think it'll be it'll it'll be a win-win in, in the competition uh, competition phase, and then leading into the other uh, the other uh, three C's as well uh, in that particular area. Things we have to look at from a sustainment enterprise going forward with rearm um, as we embrace the concept and go to things like dynamic force employment. Uh, we've got to look our APS strategy. We're in the process of doing that now. Uh, we're currently under a, a 2028 support plan, uh, but we've got to relook that going forward. 
based on some of the posture changes that are going on and will go on in the future um, in accordance with our uh, national defense strategy. And Dr. Green? Yeah, yeah just a couple quick comments. I'm impressed because uh, the force common initiatives are addressing a lot of the personnel problems that showed up in the 80s and the AMC initiatives are addressing a lot of the equipment problems that showed up in the 80s. I'll just say that in both the, the World War II and the, and the 1980s example, you know, nothing's ever going to go the way we, exactly we planned it. I mean, there's a lot of innovation, a lot of agility involved. I mean, you're, they're doing stuff in the middle of combat in World War II. They're, they're, they're modernizing in the midst of Desert Storm. Uh, yeah, there's, there are going to be ch challenges from other commitments, uh, but I'm sure the Army will, will learn to adapt the way it always does. Thank you, Dr. Green. As we wrap up, it's clear that regionally aligned uh, readiness model is necessary to prepare modernize and employ our Army forces. And the key things you heard today, uh, it'll uh, increase predictability. Of course, uh, division alignment was mentioned. And then as Dr. Crane pointed out, uh, it'll just take a look at uh, uh, how our Army will uh, sustain, equip, and fight and win under Donald PF. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you, first of all, for joining us here today. So General Flynn, General Quintus, General Walker, and Dr. Crane, thank you for your excellent uh, thoughts and comments. And for all of you who joined us at, uh, on this panel for AUSA, thank you very much.